Hello, Uggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, with a special Ask Dave here for brand new amateur radio operators. For those of you who have just received your technician and are trying to figure out what to do, welcome to amateur radio. It's a wonderful hobby. It's a deep hobby and a very broad hobby. And you've kind of put your head under the tent to see what's inside. You'll see a lot more as you go on. What we're going to talk about today is repeaters. Now, you all studied about repeaters for your technician book, and I'll give you a quick review. The question is, what repeater? Where? How do I use it? And so on. Okay, so let's take a look first at repeaters. I've got a little something on the whiteboard here. Okay, so the way this, the way this works is you transmit up to a repeater and the repeater, you do this on the input frequency, and then the repeater sends it down to the other ham on the output frequency, okay? And then this ham wants to talk to you. He's going to send back to you on the repeater's input frequency, okay? And then coming out of the output of this is going to come to you. Let's look at some of the things we've done here. First of all, we have to have a radio that works on two frequencies. That it will transmit on one frequency and listen on another. Now, on two meters, the standard separation between those frequencies is 600 kilohertz. Now, you'd think that'd be a lot, but it's not. And so you have to take special kinds of precautions up here in the repeater to separate out those. This is 2 meter. On 70 centimeter, the separation is 5 megahertz. Now you can't do that on 2 meters because the whole band is only 4 megahertz wide. But the band on 70 centimeters in the United States is 30 megahertz wide, except for a tiny sliver up near the Canadian border where they chop 10 megahertz off of that, okay? So what we have to learn is what is the repeater's input frequency? What is the repeater's output frequency? Okay, now there's a little problem that comes up with repeaters. A little problem in that if this input frequency is the same as an input frequency to another repeater, then you can have the problem of this thing hearing that when it doesn't want to hear that signal. So you put a code on yours, and this code is called CTCSS, Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System. So this repeater, if it does not hear that tone, will not repeat. So the stray signals that get over here are not repeated by yours, and that really helps. Generally, you need the CTCSS on the input frequency to the repeater. It does not necessarily repeat that over here, but this input guy has to have that same tone going up. So how do we find these tones? What do we do with them? Okay, well, let's take a look. Okay, now there are multiple sources for this. One that is nice here is called repeaterbook.com. Uh, you'll have to create an account, but it's free. But you can give them some money to help them pay for the servers and so on. There are lots of different things here. You want to go to North American repeaters. These are ads over here, don't click on those because those will push you off into Never Never Land. Come down to the map. Let's take Colorado. So I'm gonna click on Colorado and then what have I got here? Colorado Amateur Radio Repeaters Quick Search. You can do it by the frequency. You can do it by the type like DMR and so on. There are some linked systems Link system, Colorado Connection. There are other things out here, emergency service repeaters. And then you can do it by the nearest city. So lots of different ways to find things. Let's suppose you're in Montrose, near where I am, okay? Montrose, 
it comes up with five repeaters found at or near Montrose, and here they are. Okay, this is the output frequency. The one your radio will show while you are listening, because you're going to listen on this frequency. And then it tells you the offset. Now, that minus sign there is significant. It's not just a dash. It's a minus sign. Your offset is minus 0.6 megahertz. Okay? So you're going to hit 14691, and the input you're going to subtract 0.6, and you get 146.31 is the input. Many radios allow you to put in the frequency and the offset. A lot of Japanese radios know the American band plan. And so when you put in 146.91, the radio will know, oh, that's a repeater output frequency, and it'll just program the frequency that you transmit on to be minus 0.06, blow it, or minus 5, okay? This is located in Montrose, and then there's one on Waterdog Peak. There's one up uh, Raspberry that's uh, Uncompagre Plateau, one on Water Dog, another on Water Dog up there, and Raspberry Ridge, which I can't quite hit. These are open repeaters, all of them. Note that this one is dedicated to Fusion, this one to FM, and it will also do something called All Star. Okay, now let's go back down here and find, say, something different like Boulder. There are going to be a lot more repeaters there. I think. Look, yeah, oh, look at all these. These are in Boulder. Now, if you're in Boulder, you can head to others, too. Can't remember which one of these is the Boulder Image Radio Club repeater. There is one. This one is not working. The Echo Link and the IRLP is not working. It's on El Dorado Mountain. But you've got the different places that they are. Now, note here is the tone up. Now, there are some down here that use the CCs. In addition to the CTCSS, there is also something that provides uh, different kinds of codes. All the modern radios will do it. You just have to put it in. Now note that these are DMR repeaters. We have FM and All Star, FM plus Echo Link. So now if you want to know, for example, the Colorado Connection system where its repeaters are, it will tell you where its repeaters are. All of these are linked repeaters, okay? That means that if you transmit in on one of them, all of the rest of them across Colorado will transmit your signal out. And somebody who's in Winter Park here can talk back to you. So these are linked across a very wide area. Now, you might think that's a great idea, but the problem with that is that when there are too many people on the machine, people tend to want to reserve it for emergency use. They don't like to spend a lot of time talking on it. And if you talk on it for a few minutes, somebody will get on and say, this is for emergency. We'd like to keep the frequency open. The ones that seem to work best for me are the ones that just cover a certain county area. Now, here... Repeaters recommended for use by nearby highways. You can look at like US 50, which these are not linked, but these are the machines that will be within your range as you go across. So there you have it. There are the repeaters and you can get them for everywhere in the US. Now note that this has GMRS repeaters in there too. Okay, so it's repeaterbook.com and you can get membership, get in. You can hand them some money if you want. Now, there are other conglomerations of repeaters that you can get out there. So this is just one example. All right. Now, a couple advisory points about working repeaters. First of all, although it seems like you should be able to reach it, it's very possible you won't. This is because these big listings can never be completely up to date and a repeater might have just changed its CTCSS tones or it may have gone private or whatever. Most repeaters are what are called open. Now, all repeaters are held by some private agency which is a club or a group or whatever that bands together to pay the expenses of the repeater. And they'll always take a few bucks if you want to send it to them because they're forever needing something. 
Some repeaters are more sophisticated than others. Some can switch. If you're doing DMR, you can do two different conversations on the same frequency at once, and these repeaters can handle that. So there are private repeaters. Is that legal? Yes, it is. All repeaters need to be coordinated through your regional frequency coordinator. And what they do is they keep track of what are called the repeater pairs. A pair is an input frequency and an output frequency, okay? Now, there are some other funny kinds of repeaters. There's crossband repeaters, where you go in on a frequency on one band, come back on another band. It is possible to make a so-called simplex repeater, where you transmit and the repeater records that. And then as soon as you stop talking, it repeats that, what you just said. It's kind of an awkward type of a repeater. Now, there is, just like out here in Colorado, the biggest issue for litigation is Colorado water rights. Oh, that's a huge issue out here. Well, in some places, repeater frequency rights can become an issue. The FCC does not sponsor frequency coordinators. The frequency coordinators are usually voted upon by the members of the various repeater clubs or repeater service organizations that maintain the repeater. Like, for example, out here in Montrose, we have a repeater that everybody uses out of Cedar Edge, but the Montrose Amateur Radio Club has no formal connection with that repeater, even though the members of that repeater group are all members of the club. It's just because that way the repeater doesn't get caught up in club politics or something like that. Uh, if you put up a repeater that sits on an already occupied frequency, even if you haven't heard anything there from two years, you are the one that's going to get into trouble. The FCC says very clearly in part 97 that a coordinated repeater always has primacy over use of that channel pair over an uncoordinated pair. One of the reasons for coordination is to keep the repeaters out of each other's hair. Now, I will also warn you, if you'd love to be a repeater trustee and put up your own repeater, yes, you can do it, but you need to get a frequency pair from the coordinator. That can take some time. And it is, I will tell you now that all two meter pairs are taken. Okay, many of the 70 centimeter pairs are taken. The 1.25 band, the 222 megahertz band, has still got, you know, it, it hasn't been used in a while, so it's still got open repeater pairs, but not very many people have uh, 220 equipment. All the dual band radios skip right over it. So there you have it. Setting up a repeater requires doing some Oh, things with geographic information systems where you have to compute your coverage area and so on and so forth. Very often repeaters are powered by solar panels. So if there's a week long storm, you're, you're, the, the battery is going to go dead. Also down here, we have some repeaters up in the mountains that are only on in the summertime. And even then, if they're used very much, they'll drive the battery down. So you have to use them lightly. But anyway, repeaters are a very, very interesting facet of ham radio. Now, generally, you are going to end up picking a repeater that you like because you like the people on it. It may or may not be the same repeater that most members of your club use. One of the things about two meters is that you'll often get to know personally the frequent users. Then do that. Go ahead and get to know them and get together at your club meetings and talk about things. And when you hear them on the air, say something. Now, you don't call CQ on two meters. There's nothing to prevent you from doing it. But normally you just say KE0OG monitoring. That tells other people that, oh, somebody's popped on the air. If they want to talk to you, they will. If not, they won't. And you can't force anybody to talk to you. So. And if you have to interrupt a repeater conversation, make sure that you have the correct tone in your repeater. Now, 
And when you are conversing with somebody on the repeater, you're supposed to leave a short period of time after the end of your transmission before the other guy jumps in. This is so somebody can interrupt you. Somebody might say, they'll grab the mic, and as soon as you let go of the microphone, say, KE0OG here with an emergency. And then at that point, they should help you hopefully with the emergency, maybe all they can do is call 911 and uh, direct them to you or you can do a phone patch or something like that. If you don't leave a space, you're being rude and dangerous because uh, there may be somebody on frequency who needs to jump in. Uh, sometimes a person who jumps in wants to just say, Hi, Joe, just wanted to say hi. I'm out. See you guys later. You know, something like that. Or, Joe, your wife's been calling you. Get a hold of her if you would. Something like that. Whatever. Whatever. But the point is that a repeater is a shared asset. The open ones. The closed ones are composed entirely of people who've paid for the repeater. And they'll usually have a secret tone or something else some secret handshake that gets them in. And yes, that's legal. Now, just like anything that's held in common, you have something called tragedy of the commons. This is a long running problem in philosophy. And it comes from back in the old days when villagers held land in common and that they could graze their sheep on. And that works fine if everybody uses their share of the common asset. But some people come in and hog it, and so other sheep don't get fed and die of starvation. That's called the tragedy of the commons, where somebody hogs a resource that should be shared among all. Don't be one of those people. Be a ham who practices best practices, and you can have a lot of fun on repeaters. So there you go. I think that's the most thorough explanation of repeaters that I've ever made. But you can find them. You can use them. We've talked about antennas. We've talked about radios. Man, you're on your way there. Please check the page that comes up immediately after the 73 that says ways that you can help fund this channel. And pick one of them. Become a patron. Become a PayPal subscriber. Or just a one-time tip jar. Whatever you may want to do. Also, please ask questions. Please note that I don't really have time to look at all the comment questions. I wish I did, but I don't. So if you want me to answer a question, send it to sdave at arrl.org. And until we next meet, 73.